We've talked about how objects move, kinematics. Now we're going to discuss why they move, forces. So this is really the heart of physics. If you get this and like it, you're going to be golden. If you don't, it's my fault, so let's make sure this works. Newton is famous for his three laws, Newton's three laws. Really, the first two are the same law, so I'm going to write it down. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. F equals ma. This is one of the most famous equations ever known. Newton's second law. His first law is a special case. His first law is, if there's no net force on an object, force is zero, then it continues moving at a constant velocity because acceleration is zero. And if acceleration is zero, the velocity is just constant. So his first law is basically, if there's no net force applied to an object, it just keeps going as it was going before. That's called the law of inertia. And uh, the property of matter to remain in the same motion it was is called inertia sometimes. We now use that word in English all the time. We talk about systems that have a lot of inertia if they don't want to change. It's like that. Okay? It actually comes from, from this physics term. Now the second law is more useful. We can talk now about how forces create motion. For example, take this book. If I put it on the desktop, it will just sit there. Um, well, let's start there. It'll just sit there. Is gravity pulling on the book? Yes. Okay, gravity's pulling on the book. Why is it not falling? The table is pushing up. Okay, so the table is pushing up on the book with uh, a force that perfectly balances gravity. Now look, I'm pushing on the book. So now it has gravity plus me pushing. And the table has to be pushing up with a greater force now in order for the book not to move. The one thing you know is if the book is not moving, there is no net force on it. Okay? And you also know that gravity is always operating. Okay, suppose I push the book. I can push it and it will move. And if I stop pushing it, it stops. Anyone know why? There must be a force opposing my force, right? What could that be? Friction. friction. It's friction. Between the book and the table, there is friction. You can hear it. So, um, and in fact, if I may, if I lift the table, it's now at an incline. And now a component of gravity is along the incline. The book is not moving, even though there's a force due to gravity down the incline. If I tip it up higher, <laughs> disturbing my f f first row students here, eventually the friction will not be sufficient to oppose gravity and it will start sliding. And then it accelerates off the table. Okay? So there's a normal force pushing up on everything like you. You're sitting, I'm standing. Thank goodness the floor is pushing me up so I don't get fall through the floor and your chairs are pushing you up so you don't fall through the seats. Normal force. Friction is keeping many things from happening. Um, in the Example I discussed last time where you're going in circular motion in a fairground ride and you're plastered against the wall, it's friction that's keeping you up.
maybe I should explain how the frictional force works. The force due to friction, which sometimes we use a lowercase f to describe the frictional force, is less than or equal to a coefficient of static friction times the normal force. And normal force, I will usually write n. Normal force, normal, the word normal in this context just means perpendicular to the surface. It's normal to the surface. So, for example, if I push, um, sorry, this book feels a normal force upward perpendicular to the surface of the table. The frictional force is greater if the normal force is greater. Okay, so when I push on that book, let's see, if it's a heavy book, it's less likely to move when I push with a given force than if it's a light book. And the reason it's less than is right now, right this minute, is there a force of friction on that book? No. 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 Why not? It's not moving. It's not moving, so there's no net force on it. And if there were a force of friction on it, which way would it be pointing? Opposite direction of the push. The opposite direction of the push. So as long as there's no horizontal push on it, it's not there's no force of friction. As soon as I begin to push, and I'll just push lightly so it doesn't move, okay, I'm pushing on it, but now friction is pointing the opposite way. And the harder I push on it, the harder the frictional force the other way, until I exceed the maximum possible, and then it starts moving. And the same with lifting the table up. Gradually, as you increase the angle, the component of gravity that's along the incline increases as you increase the angle, and eventually it overcomes friction, and then the thing will accelerate. Okay. There's a couple of other kinds of force I want to mention. There's a, a, a contact force, which is a push or a pull. This is me pushing on the book. Um, if I had a rope tied to the book, I could pull on it. And then uh, the tension in the rope is a, the force that's pulling on the book. I'm pulling on the rope, it's pulling on the book. Okay. In the 17th century, Otto von Guericke, a physicist in Magdeburg, Germany, I guess, fitted two hollow bronze hemispheres together uh, and removed the air uh, with a pump. So they're now um, held together basically by the vacuum inside. Two eight-horse teams, one attached to each hemisphere, could not pull the brass spheres apart. Suppose he had tied both teams of horses to one side of the sphere and tied the other one to a tree. In that case, would the tension, the pulling apart the spheres have been greater? Let's draw what this is, and this will start us talking about how to think about forces graphically. So there's two cases here, right? There's the first case where I have one team of horses. Let's just draw them as eight horses that way. and eight horses that way. Okay, that's one condition. So they're pulling with some tension this way and some tension that way. I expect those would be very similar in magnitude if the two teams aren't very different. They'd each be pulling pretty hard. Okay, and then the second case is where I put both teams of horses over here and I tie it to a tree on this side. Okay, What's the tension pulling this way now? 2T. It's 2T, because they're both pulling this way. And what's the tension that the tree is pulling? 2T. 2T, because at the beginning it's not moving. So in this condition, it's actually got more force pulling the two spheres apart than when you put them on opposite sides. In this case, they have a total, they have a total of T on each side pulling. In this case, they have a total of two T on each side pulling. This brings me to what I want to talk about, F equal, some more about F equals MA. Let me give you a couple of thoughts and rules and going forward. <clears throat> We're going to talk about how to describe forces on objects. And there's a couple of rules. Right now, the objects we're talking about, we are considering to be point particles. Okay, so if I tell you, for example, I have an inclined plane, like the table I lifted up, 
and I put a box on it. It's sitting on the inclined plane. Maybe I tell you that this angle is some number. Right now, until we do rotation, we're going to talk about this box as a point. That is, I don't care how wide it is or how tall it is. Those are things that have to do with how it might rotate, which we're not talking about now. We're just treating it like a point mass. That's rule number one. Rule number two is when is we are going to learn to draw a free body diagram, or sometimes it's called a force body diagram or a force diagram. We are going to isolate a body and draw the forces on it. So let's do that for this case, okay? If I'm looking at the block, what are the forces on the block? Savannah. Gravity. Gravity. And that is down, right? When I when I apply the force of gravity, I must apply it to the center of mass of the box. Now, the whole thing is a point for our purposes here, but I'm just going to draw it correctly from the center of mass down. And it's the force due to gravity, and that is equal to mass times acceleration. So g, the acceleration due to gravity near the surface of the Earth. Okay, what other force? Katie. Uh, the normal force of the slope on the box. The normal force, and that's perpendicular to the surface. So it's there, the normal force. Here's a key point. I'm drawing the tail of the force vector where the force is acting. Again, for a point particle, we don't care so much. I'm just trying to get you in a good habit, OK? And where the normal force is acting is at the contact point here. So that's why the tail of the force is there, OK? What other forces are acting? Well, I'll tell you that this block is not moving. So what other force must there be? Friction. Friction. And where does that go? Um, parallel to the slope up. Right. So the force of friction acts in this direction, opposing the motion. If there were no friction force, you can see there's a net force that's going to fall down the slope. Okay. If it were frictionless, it would slide right down. So there is a friction force keeping it from sliding down. Okay. These are the three forces and the only three forces acting on this block. If I add these three vectors, I get the motion of that block. Now, I know the block is not going to move through the surface of the inclined plane. Okay? It's the hard surface like this table. And the normal force will adjust so that the block does not crash through the incline. So that means that the normal force balances the component of gravity, but I can create a component that is perpendicular to the incline and a component that is parallel to the incline. And I can think of the gravitational force as the sum of those two components, as we discussed in a previous lecture. So the normal force will be as big as it has to be to balance this component of gravity, and they will cancel. So there's no net force perpendicular to the surface. But there is a net force along the incline pointing down if there's no friction. And if there is friction, then friction balances this one exactly if it's not, if it's not moving. Physicists love to do problem sets. If you take a physics class um, in college, you will have a problem set due every week. And a typical problem set would be somebody telling you, I have a block on an inclined plane. The mass of the block is this. The angle of the plane is that. Uh, it is moving or it isn't moving. Draw the free body diagram and calculate something. Calculate you know, the coefficient of friction or something else. Why do we do that? We don't do that because inclined planes are exciting objects or because blocks on inclined planes are you know, the end of uh, excitement. It's because this is a tool for learning how to draw free body diagrams and how to, um, how to interpret this very important equation. This equation is really at least, um, can be really up to three equations, right? It's a vector equation. We live in a three-dimensional world. So that means we can have an x component, a y component, and a z component. In most problems that we'll do in the next few lectures, we're only going to use two dimensions. Here I have two dimensions, right? This problem you can define axes. Let me do that here. I'm going to define the y direction this way and the x direction that way. 
I'm doing that because that way I can put the motion in the x direction and I know there's no motion in the y direction. That's why I choose this particular set of axes. As an aside, if I were to choose any other pair of axes, I could choose y being up and x being horizontal, or I could choose y being over there and x being perpendicular to it. It doesn't matter, I would still get the right answer because physics is the same independent of what coordinate system you choose. But the math is much simpler if you choose, make this choice because then you have motion in this direction and no motion in the other direction. Let's pause a moment and see if I can stump you with some other questions. A car is moving in the plus x direction at constant speed. What can you say is true about the force on that car? Car is moving at constant speed in the plus x direction. Yeah. The net force is zero. The net force is zero. Why? Because um, since it's a constant velocity, then there's no acceleration. It's a constant velocity because the direction's not changing and the speed's not changing. And if it's constant velocity, there's no acceleration. And if A is zero, F is zero. That doesn't mean there are no forces operating on the car. It just means the net force is zero. All right, let me see if I can get you. A car rounds a curve while maintaining a constant speed. Is there a net force on the car as it rounds the curve? Katie. Is there a force towards the center, centripetal force? Because it's pushing the car that way, yes. Another way to say it is the speed is constant, but the direction is changing. Therefore, the velocity is changing. Therefore, there's an acceleration. So you don't need the speed to change to have an acceleration. In fact, in uniform circular motion, which we discussed previously, as an object goes around in a circle, the direction of its velocity vector is constantly changing. So it is constantly accelerating. It always has a positive acceleration toward the center of the circle. OK, let's do, let's do another one. You are a passenger in a car and not wearing your seatbelt, <coughs> which would be very wrong. Without changing speed, the car makes a sharp left turn. How would you describe the force between you and the car? What happens when you turn left? When the car turns left, what do you feel? Josh? You go right. You want to go straight, and the car is turning left. So it's shoving you in the arm to make your body go with the car. Otherwise, you would fly off going straight if there were no force on you. So it is pushing you to turn left. The reason I bring this up is this is often something that people misinterpret because as you're turning, you feel like you're flung outward. People describe it as being pushed out from a turn. But you're really just trying to go straight. There's nothing pushing you out at all. You're trying to go straight, and the car is keeping you in the car. OK. Let's go back to the textbook. If I'm pushing the textbook, and it's moving at constant velocity, is there a force of friction acting on the book? Yeah. Yes. Why? There's still a force acting on it, just um, the kinetic friction force is less than the force from your hand pushing on it. Ah. OK, is it? It's moving at constant uh, velocity, yeah. right? So if it's moving at constant velocity, what do I know? There's no net. There's no net force. And I am pushing on it. Yeah. Therefore, I'm, my push must be opposed by friction, yeah. an equal and opposite friction. And that's why it's staying at constant velocity. OK, one more question, because we talked about it before, is the situation of the ride at the fair that is the thing you're plastered against the wall and it's going around fast enough that you don't slip off the wall. So there's a circular ride with vertical walls, some kind of floor, and you go in and you're sitting against that wall or this wall, and then this thing starts whirling around, rotating, and as it goes faster and faster, at some point, they'll drop the floor, and you are plastered against the wall, and you don't fall. It's kind of a scary moment for parents and a fun moment for children. OK, let's take a person who is right on this part of the diagram. OK, there is the person. They're inside the wall. What are the forces on that person? There's the force of gravity, right? So that is down. Force of gravity, mg, down. What else? Yeah. There's normal force. 
there's a normal force, and that has to be perpendicular to the surface, so it has to be this way. Now, for someone over here, it's out of the board. For someone over there, it's toward the center. Oh, it could also be this way, right? It's got to be perpendicular to the surface. I kind of jumped the gun and drew, drew it inward. Why did I draw it inward? Because your back's on the wall of the thing. Yes, and if you're sort of pushing against it, it's pushing you that way, yes. Another way to say it is this is the force that makes you go in a circle. Okay, you're going to actually go in a circle here because the wall is pushing you to do so. If the wall were not there, you would just go straight. If the wall could evaporate instantaneously, whatever your velocity at that moment, that's the direction you'd keep going because there's nothing pushing you to go in a circle any longer. If those are the only two forces, I think this person's going to go in that direction. Yeah? Is there a friction force acting against the gravity? There's a friction force acting against the gravity. And it's the force of static friction, which is always less than or equal to mu static, that's a coefficient, times the normal. The coefficient of static friction is a characteristic of the materials involved. So if you have two pieces of sandpaper, they have a much higher coefficient of static friction than something slippery would have. If you start moving, then the frictional force is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction, mu k, times the normal force. And mu k is always less than the coefficient of static friction, mu s. So if you have a balance like this, that at some moment is overcome, like suppose that thing starts slowing down. Well, as it slows down, they bring the floor up. Because if they don't bring the floor up, the normal force is going to be less, because you're moving slower, your centripetal acceleration is less. And so mu times the normal force is less, and so you can fall if the thing slows down. So that's why they bring the floor back. OK. Yes. Uh, what is the force propelling you against the normal force so that you're not flying towards the middle? Ah, good question. What, you know, what force balances this normal force? There is none. And that's because you are, in fact, accelerating. And you're accelerating toward the center of the circle. That's what going in circular motion means. You have an acceleration toward the center. So this normal force is exactly the force you need in fact, we can use this law, F equals ma, to say that normal force has to equal m, the mass of that person, times the centripetal acceleration, which you remember is v squared over the radius of the circle. So another kind of trick of this uh, game at the, at the amusement park is that you want the circle to be smaller so the normal force is higher so you don't fall down. Okay, and yes, you do have a net motion in the inward direction. Let's do another problem. Here is your bathroom scale. You stand on it. What are the forces on you? Yep, Sean? Gravity. Gravity? I go to the center of mass, gravity is pointing down, mg. What else? Normal force. Normal force. Okay, and that's pointing on your feet, and that's up. Okay, normal force. When you get on the scale, you're not moving, right? So you know that the normal force up minus the gravitational force down, mg, it must equal zero because you're not moving, okay? You're not accelerating up or down. So the normal force must equal the gravitational force. Let me say that another way. The normal force is equal to your weight, mg. Your weight is your mass times the acceleration in the gravitational field of the Earth. That's your weight on the Earth. If you were on the moon, where g has about one-sixth the value it has on Earth, the weight you would measure on the scale is actually one-sixth of the weight you me measure on the Earth, which is your correct weight. They're both correct. <laughs> yes, they're both correct. The weight, you have to specify where you are in order for the term weight to have a meaning, because in the Gravitational field of the Earth, you might weigh 150 pounds, and the gravitational field of the moon, 
you weigh 25 pounds. So that's one way to go on a diet, but it doesn't change anything about your mass, okay? It just changes your weight because you were up there. And in fact, it is a problem for astronauts. One of the things that everybody really wants to go to the, back to the moon or go to Mars, one of the problems that astronauts have is when they're in space, they are effectively, especially in low Earth orbit, they're effectively weightless. Now, are they weightless because gravity is too weak where they are? No, because they're actually very close to the surface of the Earth. The space station is at about 500 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. The radius of the Earth is about 6,400 kilometers. So it's really not very far above the surface of the Earth. Gravity is just as strong there. So why do astronauts feel weightless? Yeah. Uh, because they're in free fall and they're traveling fast enough that they don't quite fall into the atmosphere, but they keep, they just keep falling around the Earth. Yeah, so let's draw a picture of this. I'll come back to the scale in a moment, but let's draw a picture of this. So we have the Earth, here's a satellite, it's orbiting, and it's going basically around like so. It can be space station, it can be the Hubble Space Telescope, whatever. Gravity is definitely pulling on that object, okay? The reason satellites orbit the Earth is that Every time the satellite goes a little bit this way, it falls toward the center just enough to remain on the circular orbit, or on the nearly circular orbit. So the whole time the satellite is there, or the, peop or the space station, or the people in the space station, they're all falling the entire time they're in space. They're free falling. What free falling means is if you suddenly the floor was gone, you would be free falling through space. There would be the force of gravity on you and no other force. So you'd be accelerating at the, at G, at the acceleration G. And in that condition, you feel weightless. Let's go back to the scale. You'll see why. Let's go back to the scale. So here we are. Uh, you're on your scale. We've uh, agreed that you have a force down on you due to gravity and a normal force up. Let me now talk about the scale. What is the force down on the scale? For this, we need to know Newton's third law, okay? Very important third law. It sometimes doesn't get the same press, but anyway. The force of one body on another. So let's say body number one on body number two is equal and opposite to the force of body two on body one. Same magnitude, opposite direction. So if I push on Charlotte, okay, she pushes back on me. I, uh, well, uh, yeah, unless I make you move and then, well, but, but in any case, push, when you push something, it pushes back on you with an equal and opposite force, okay? So, what are the forces on the scale? There's a gravitational force down, the mass of the person times g, and there's a normal force from the scale up. So let's call that the normal force from the scale on the person. And those two forces must be equal, and op op they're opposite, so they must be equal in order for the person not to be moving. So the force of the scale on the person the force up minus the force down must equal zero because the acceleration is zero. Therefore, the normal force of the scale on the person is equal to the mass of the person times g, in other words, their weight. So the scale is registering your weight, okay? If I wanted to look at the scale rather than the person, I could talk about the forces on the scale. Okay, let's do that, and I'll draw those in blue. What are the forces on the scale? So first of all, it feels a gravitational force down, which is the mass of the scale times g. It feels a normal force up from the floor. Let's call that the normal force of the floor on the scale, okay? And there's one more force, which is the force of the person down on the scale. The person is pressing on the scale. So that's a force that we have just, that has to be equal and opposite to this force. Right? The normal force of the scale on the person, the force with which the scale pushes up on a person, has to equal the force with which the person pushes down on the scale. 
So it's equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. So I'll just draw it over here. The force of the person on the scale must equal minus the force of the scale on the person, which was up. And so it's, it's mg pointing down. Okay, so the person pushes on the scale with a force mg, and the scale pushes up on the person with a force mg. This is really important for our last concept here, because we're going to talk about a sort of interesting case that you actually experience in your daily life. You take elevators, right? You have been on an elevator. And if you're in a tall enough building and the elevator's fast, you get a kind of funny, queasy feeling when you take off and when you land. Like when you, let's say we're going up, okay? So the elevator starts accelerating up, and then maybe it's going at constant velocity, and then it slows down to get to the floor you want. As it's accelerating up, what do you feel? You feel heavy. Okay, right? And when it's stopping at the top, you feel weird. <laughs> you feel a little weird, especially if it stops quickly. Okay, why is that? Let's look at a person in an elevator. And the elevator is going up, let's say. What are the forces on the person? Okay, you all know this by now. Savannah, yeah. Gravity and normal. Very good. Gravity down, mg and the normal force up. And I'll write that as the normal force of the elevator on the person. Okay? EP. Now, let's realize that this vehicle could be accelerating. Right? It could be accelerating to start to go up or to slow down, or it could be accelerating down and then stopping. Okay? So, A may not be zero. In that case, here's, here is how this free body diagram translates or relates to Newton's second law. Here are the only forces acting on the person. There are other forces in this problem, okay? There's some kind of cable pulling the elevator up. Maybe there's a, um, in the shorter elevators, there are those, whatever they are, um, scissors that expand. You know, for a short elevator, they'll often do it with things underneath pushing up. So there are other forces in the problem. But we, in order to think about it cleanly, we isolate the body. We think just about one body. We can think about the elevator if you want, or we can think about the top of the building if you want. But right now, we're thinking about the person, okay? And these are the only two forces that person feels. The only contact point is the feet in the elevator. So that's the upward push. And then gravity, which is pulling on everything. So it's pulling the person down. Those are the only two forces. So this free body diagram, first of all, you can draw it. And second of all, you can now apply Newton's second law. Remember, this is a vector law, so I have to solve it in each dimension. There's only one dimension in this problem, so it's really easy. It's an up-down dimension. So turning this diagram into that equation is very simple. It's the sum of the forces, so I have the upward force plus the downward force, which is to say the upward force the normal force of the elevator on the person, minus, because of the direction, the weight of the person. That's the left-hand side of this equation. And the right-hand side of this equation is the mass of the person times their acceleration. Okay? So this is Newton's second law in action for a person in an elevator. If the elevator is going at constant velocity, the acceleration is zero, and they feel the normal force that is their weight. So that's what you're used to when you're just standing on a floor. You feel a normal force equal to your weight. But if the elevator is accelerating upward, so A is positive, then the normal force has to be bigger than mg. Your m and g are not changing, right? You have a mass, whatever you have, and g is just a constant. So the normal force has to be bigger. Katie. On the right side of the equation, which mass would you consider, the elevator and the person? Good question. It's the same mass for the object you've isolated the forces on. So you're just looking at the motion of the person. It's true the elevator is also accelerating, but you don't, you, this is, oh, what a good question. This is what, this is where people get lost sometimes in physics, myself included. You, you sort of think in, you're thinking about all the pieces. And I promise you, you just do this really simple thing of isolating a body and only looking at what's pushing or pulling it. 
And applying this, this is then the mass of that body only, not the other ones. Okay, so, so you're also pushing down on the floor and many other things are happening, but we don't consider those because that's, I'm not pushing on myself, right? The floor is pushing on me and gravity is pulling me down. Okay, so I know if I'm accelerating up, the normal force is bigger than my weight. Let's say I'm at the top of the building and it starts down really quickly. So it's accelerating down really fast. So A is big and it's negative. Let's write it this way. Let me rearrange this equation so that I write that the normal force, because that's the thing you feel, what you feel is the normal force, is equal to your mass, ma plus mg, or mass times g plus a. In this form, it's very easy to see. When you're not accelerating, you feel a force upward, which is your weight, mg. When you're accelerating upwards, so A is positive, then this thing is bigger and you feel heavier. So when you're accelerating up, you feel heavier. If A is negative, then you feel less than your weight. And if A is equal to minus G, if you were accelerating downward with acceleration G, what normal force would you feel? Zero. Zero. That's why we call it free fall. You're accelerating, but you just feel weightless. So this is an aside. NASA has this very cool plane. It's a plane that flies in a, a big parabolic sections, OK, like this. It just goes up and down like this. And during the segment when it's going down, which lasts about, about 15 seconds or something, you are, you are effectively weightless, because they fly down at uh, basically at g. Okay, acceleration G, so you are temporarily weightless. And you can see films on YouTube. Um, a lot of our students at Yale have gone flying on the plane. It's very cool. And then, of course, when they're accelerating up again, then they feel super heavy. So they have to be warned to, you know, watch out, we're going to do the turn. And then they all wait till it gets to the top, and then they're weightless again when it goes to the bottom. So maybe you'll do that someday. Um, okay, let's do one more thing and call it, call it a close for this session. If I put a person in an elevator on a scale, and I tell you that the elevator is accelerating up, then I want to know what does the scale read? What weight does the scale read if the elevator is accelerating up? Yes, it's Um When you go up, doesn't the scale read a number that's higher than your actual weight? Yes, higher than your weight. Why? Because there's more force pulling you upward. That's right. So the normal force of the scale on you has to be more than your weight. And Newton's third law comes in. The force of you on the scale is the same as the force of the scale on you. So the scale, if we look at it, it must register a heavier person than you normally would be. So a way to go on an anti-diet is to get in the elevator and accelerate up. Now the sad news is that I think even with your phone, your phone has an accelerometer in it or your laptop does. Um, this is, um, it, it detects acceleration, and the reason for that is so that it, um, it can protect itself if you drop it. So when you drop your laptop, it actually has time to go into like safe mode and not get killed, okay? You can take that same accelerometer, and there are programs that can show you how fast you're accelerating. So you could try to do this in an elevator. But in my experience, they're not, they don't actually accelerate very fast, and that's mostly because people don't like it when it stops and your stomach kind of lifts and it's, you know what? It's exactly like getting on the Ferris wheel or the roller coaster. So people like me don't like it, so they don't accelerate elevators very quickly. Sorry to say, sorry to say for you fun people. Okay, so this section has been about Newton's laws. Newton's first law is basically a body in motion with no force on it tends to remain in the same motion. Other words, its acceleration is zero. Newton's very important second law that the force on a body equals its mass times its acceleration. If you know the forces, you can talk about the motion of the body, because we've told you how to go from acceleration to velocity to displacement. So it, the forces fully determine the motion of the body. Okay. Or if somebody tells you how the body is moving, like for example, it's going in a circle, then you can figure out what the force is. 
or the body is in an elevator, you can figure out what the force is. So that's Newton's second law. And then the third law, which sometimes we tend to under praise because it's so simple, is it's really important. When you push on something, it pushes back with an equal and opposite force. And that will come into play with much of the physics we keep on doing. So pretty dry stuff, but very, very important to understanding how to, how to describe the world around us.